Next up we have David talking about the psychomatics approach to medicine. Great. Well, thanks John and thanks very much for organising a splendid day. Amazing how many people are working in the same area. Uh, good. So, I, mean, I got into this field through co-writing a book. We paid good money for that cover. You know. We paid an important artist. Don't know what's happened to him. Um, written with a, a friend of mine who was a psychoanalyst. Uh, we were trying to return back to the, the phase in the history of the study of medicine when the psychosomatic approach flourished, where psychosomatic referred to the uh, treatment of people uh, as having a mind and a body, so that their illness, uh, to the extent somebody had an illness, one should treat them as a person with a mind. So in particular, something you notice, uh, and this era really flourishes through the middle of the 20th century, um, a much more individualized kind of medicine. You'd have a lot more case studies going on, individual case studies. So let's have a look at one of those. As I had a psychoanalyst colleague, of course, there was anything to do with sexuality, of course. He was, <laughs> was on to it in like a shot. Um, so here's a case, quite late, 1968, this one appeared. 20-year-old soldier developed an uticarial right? eruption on the back of his legs, thighs, and buttocks. These lesions had an odd transverse linear pattern to them, resembling the welts one might receive from a whipping. Now, what do you think brought that about? <laughs> well, of course, uh, when he was a nine or ten-year-old boy, he'd been whipped for the offence of peeking through the windows, the window of a girl's dormitory. Uh, so I think his father had whipped him. The recurrence of these lesions ten years later took place immediately after he'd been apprehended, loitering on the grounds of the nurse's dormitory at the military post where he was stationed. He'd hoped to see a nurse he was interested in, but was caught by an officer and reprimanded. Within an hour, the skin lesion had developed. Okay, so a nice, rich sort of story. Uh, I mean, really quite a plausible story, I would say. I mean, you know, why else did, did he produce welts in that very, uh, uh, in that very unusual pattern? Uh, he's got a memory of this particular event of being whipped by his father. We, we, it's re-evoked uh, so many years later by a rather similar situation see somebody in authority, it's not his father anymore, it's an officer. Okay, so the second time around, obviously there's no, there's no physical uh, action on the guy, it's just uh, re-evoked. Uh, okay, so there were loads of these sorts of stories. So they're very plausible on the one hand. Uh, they often involve this, this, this rather uh, uh, ideographic, if you like that word, a very particular detail. Um, I mean, obviously it's not totally out of this world. I mean, it's quite believable that this is, this is what happened. There's some generalizability there. Uh, you know, could you set up an experiment? Well, I don't know, take some 10 year old boys and <laughs> do some whipping and so on, and let's see 20 years, you know, 10 years later. But uh, it's, it's plausible, you, you might think something, you know, we might find some generalizability there. But we're way off, aren't we, from doing anything that you might think would be amenable to the gold standard, the, the double blind RCT. <laughs> okay, so if we're expanding evidence, and we've had uh, uh, Michael telling us to look beyond, well, and others, look, look beyond the RCT to mechanistic evidence, let's go to anecdote as well. Let's have the full range. Let's throw it all in there. Let's have anecdotes like Engel's story there. And there's a whole slew of evidence from the, this field. Uh, I mean, some of it, again, not particularly controversial, but large-scale observations. You know, the Whitehall study, which teaches us to not to be stay at the bottom of the pile in your job. Make sure you get to the top. This is the civil service. If you, if you, if you stay at the bottom rank, you will die earlier from just about every disease. Get yourself up that greasy pole as fast as you can. <laughs> Rosetta, go and live, live in a cohesive community. Don't live in an in a isolated community. Live in a lovely, cohesive, egalitarian society. That teaches you that. A, so make sure you don't get abused as a child, don't, don't suffer traumas as a child, because you will die early from cancer, heart disease, etc. etc. Et um, the common cold unit, that's a, that was set up in the Salisbury Plain after the war, went on for maybe 20, 20, 30 years, I think. Really detailed studies of the uh, likelihood of getting a cold when a, a virus was placed up your nose, what was the likelihood of you developing a cold, uh, and it was dependent on your, your state, uh, you know, whether you'd just been made unemployed, whether you just left your wife. Okay, vast, vast amounts of data that came from these studies. Again, which get seen as now very secondary, don't they, because they're not RCT-based. 
Uh, a lot of small scale stuff. Uh, we can test our students uh, and uh, it takes 40% longer for wounds to heal if they're taking exams at that time, if they're going through the stress of their exams. Why have you been wounding your students? Oh, you do this, you punch a hole in their mouth <laughs> in the holiday time and the exam time and it takes them 40% longer to heal in the exam time. They agree to this, they get paid. Like, is that the fail rate? The Actually, maybe, this, maybe this is why we should sell this <laughs> as our, why we don't have exams in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all of sorts of other things, DNA repair mechanisms. Uh, you can take blood out of people and, uh, who are very stressed and their DNA repair won't work as well. Uh, their cell death won't work as well. Our apoptosis won't work as well if people are stressed. Um, of course, hard to explore in the human, easier in the animal, which of course you can do, because you can do as unpleasant a thing to a rat as you care to. Uh, and you can find some stuff, you can find enzymes that are missing or lacking in uh, mice that you've stressed horribly, like making them swim for hours without a place to put their feet, that sort of thing. Um, and it will reduce this, the enzyme which plays this role in uh, protecting them from cancer. So you know, afterwards you can come along, you can inject tumours in them and see whether they survive or not. Do very, lots of very unpleasant things. Um, but hypnosis, that went on for years, hypnosis research, particularly, you know, particularly skin disorders. People could do interesting things like sort of chase the symptoms around the body using hypnosis. People have rashes somewhere and they could sort of bring out rashes. They could sort of displace them and put them to other parts of the body through hypnosis. Even the removal of warts. It does carry on, this, I use this word ideographic, this, this uh, more individual, idio, the single, the individual, as opposed to something more law-like uh, in the psychosomatic tradition. There are, there are people still going on. Nick Reed, he was a gastroenterologist who uh, retrained. He realised that so many of the people he saw in his gut clinics uh, were people who were struggling in life. He retrained as a psychotherapist. And if you read his book, uh, I mean, again, many, many case studies of people going through the difficulties in their lives. Uh, they may have had something that brought about a, a serious illness in the gut when they're younger, and then it gets re evoked later on. So, a lot in this tradition is around the timing, the timing of symptoms, the timing of the emergence of symptoms. Good. Okay, so, um, yeah, one of my concerns when you come, so after this, when I came to the philosophy of medicine, there's so much talk, isn't there? About, RCTs as though this is the, the key the, the key to life um, and one of the troubles uh, so to the extent that, that my little bit of my world that I was interested in gets covered it tends to get covered through the analysis of what is the placebo effect particularly through the through the the, the goggles the, the lenses of, of this evidence-based approach the RCT approach uh, I did promise those some people to, just to a little story to, to, to make sure they, they came. Uh, there was a nice case of how dangerous placebos can be. So we'll have a look at that. So this is the case of somebody who was on a trial. He had depression. He was uh, uh, on a trial for a new antidepressant. Um, so randomized, put into the trial. Uh, gets home. A few days later, his girlfriend leaves him. Can't stand it. Decides to end it all. Pours down the bucket of all the pills he's been given. <laughs> so what happened to him? So he arrives, pale and di diaphoretic, with a blood pressure of 80, 40, and a heart rate of 110, tremulous, respirations rapid. Uh, examination otherwise unremarkable. Uh, they start infusing saline, they're checking all the sort of levels, various levels in his body, urine, drug screen, negative. There's, you know, what the hell's wrong with this guy? So he's got two liters of saline's gone through, blood pressure starts to rise again, and they think that's, okay, perhaps we can turn it off now. Uh, but the, the blood pressure drops again as soon as they stop doing that. So they carry on giving more saline. He's been given six litres of fluid. And he's lethargic with blood pressure 162 and a heart rate 106. And meanwhile, people, of course, know he's been on the trial. They go and look to see which of the wings he's on, and they find out he's on the placebo wing. Uh, and informed of this, oh, oh what a surprise, um, and relieved. <laughs> and within 15 minutes, he's, he's back to where he was. <laughs> blood pressure down 126, 80, heart rate 80. So he's back to normal. OK, so it's quite a dangerous, isn't it? <laughs> Who thought? Who knew? Okay, so uh, I mean, one place I suppose if I, if I want to attack some stuff in the existing literature, here's this is old Jeremy Howick. Those uh, who were the talk I gave a few whenever that was earlier in last term, 
I would have seen this before. This is his attempt. Various people have said, let's give up. It's hopeless. There's no way you can define placebo. It's impossible. It doesn't make any sense. Howick thinks, because he's a big fan of the RCT, uh, thinks we better have, have, have a definition of placebo. Um, goes back to Grunbaum's account, and this is, this is what he comes up with. He tweets Grunbaum's account. And basically says it's all going to be relative to a certain kind of therapy, that you're, you've got some kind of practice, some sort of therapy that you, you are targeting at some condition. That therapy will have the characteristic features, the things special to it, and it will also have some, some other stuff, some incidental features. Uh, and then there's a thing we're aiming for, the target disorder, and then some other stuff going on in the patient's life. Uh, and the, the stuff we really care about are the positive non-placebo effects, or, or the toxic effect up there, and everything else. I mean, there are things like placebo effects and side effects and so on. Okay, and the idea is then to set things up in such a way that you can sort of subtract away. You can take the therapy tea and then you can contrast it with something else, another therapy, which has got those same incidental features but sort of lacks the characteristic one. Okay, and then the placebo effect is going to be produced by these incidental features. Uh, even, right, yeah, especially when the treatment as a whole is a non-placebo. Uh, but also you can have generic sort of placebo uh, treatments. So, so something important to do, you, you can't just tell whether something uh, is a placebo effect or not. You've got to specify it in the therapeutic regime that you're practicing, what you take to be the characteristic. Non-characteristic parts. Uh, okay, so that's going to raise some questions, particularly when you start studying, you, you know, maybe a bit suspicious does acupuncture work. But you're going to have to make these sorts of decisions to know whether you should be contrasting full-on acupuncture with, with a kind of acupuncture which presses the skin somehow but doesn't pierce it. So you've got to make all those sorts of strange decisions uh, as to what exactly counts as characteristic of acupuncture. Uh, it's going to be very difficult, isn't it, around these sort of like a psychotherapy, what, what exactly counts as characteristic of a psychotherapeutic intervention. Does you being supportive of the patient count as part of your, is that characteristic part of your therapy? But then every kind of therapy is doing that, so what is characteristic, what isn't characteristic? Um, so you might have thought, well, surgery, that's straightforward, the, the, the bit that's characteristic is me slicing you open and doing some stuff inside you, but who knows, I mean, maybe it's the actual, it's the making the incisions, the key bit, maybe I shouldn't be contrasting slicing you open and doing some stuff inside you versus, I don't know, more, putting you to sleep and waking you up again. Maybe I should be contrasting slicing you open and doing things with just slicing you open and doing nothing, sewing you back up. So, and very often they find, in fact, that the, just the slicing bit has the same effect as the slicing and doing things to you. But these sham surgeries seem to work. So you've got to make these decisions, and it's not at all clear. But what about just ordinary medicine when you're, when you're giving pills out? What is, is you being enthusiastic? Is, is, is Hugh there saying, and this Mrs. Jones will make you much better? Is that part of the treatment <laughs> or not? In which case, what do we contrast when we do these, these trials? Okay, um, so we know that modern painkillers uh, don't work as well. You can, you can do some interesting studies about giving them in a hidden way, so you've got them given to you on a drip. You don't know when you're going to get them. You could be told over the next few days, some days you'll be fed a placebo, some days you may be fed, fed the real thing. You don't know when you're getting which. Okay. Uh, it's evidently clear that you get much more effect if you know you're getting the real thing. Okay, if it's if it's if it's spoken to you that you are. So, well, I, I suppose the drug company can say, well, that was part of, of course, that's part of our therapy. You want to take that bit away, because otherwise we're not doing very well. Uh, so we better have it that it's given in an open way. Uh, okay, but of course these are. To the extent you're probably going to incline to think that the, the positive attitude bit was part of the incidental features, then that suggests that there's a pretty strong placebo effect going on, even in the, uh, the giving of the real drug. But there seems to be this, this idea, that almost there's this sort of subtraction process going on, as though, well, it didn't, wouldn't matter too much. You, you might have thought that giving the real drug in a hidden way minus the placebo in a hidden way, that difference should be the same as the real drug in an open way minus the placebo in an open way. But it doesn't work like that. Things aren't linear, unfortunately. So there's a recent paper from, well, fairly recent from The Lancet. There's some painkiller, proglumide, shown to be better than placebo, which was in turn better than no treatment, post-operative pain. Uh, 
So you might have thought, well, okay, that's fine. So these things are operating separately. There's the placebo-y bit, and then there's the, the, the drug bit, and they're both acting, and they're subbing together, and that explains why, why we've got this two-step process of improvement. But unfortunately, uh, when they were probed, I was given hidden in a hidden way, and uh, it had no effect. So there seems to be this, uh, this joint effect going on. This, uh, you, seem to, you seem to need both. You seem to need the, the openness plus the drug to produce an effect. Okay, so the drug is, is interacting with enha enhancing the placebo mechanisms. That makes life a little complicated. Um, okay, so then when you're thinking about the characteristic features again, I mean, so, so, so much is involved, isn't it, when you're handing out, uh, when you're going through the protocol to, to, to give out this drug. All sorts of things about the, the colour of the drug, the, the colour of the pill, what it's spoken about. Uh, how you deal with the patient may be concerned about side effects and how you talk to them and so on and so forth. All sorts of things are going to be involved. And in particular, this de-blinding, this is an important thing of patient and staff. How much does that happen? Okay, so, so one thing you might think is quite likely to happen is that because there is a characteristic feature, and we'll say a lot of these antidepressants will have side effects like causing your mouth to go dry, that makes you aware that you're on the real wing of the trial, and that's going to have then this multiplying effect with the placebo effect on the target disorder. So that seems problematic. You, you, you see, you might have thought, because you were just comparing that with your placebo, you might have attributed all this to the, the what is characteristic, the, the, the ingredients in the actual pill. But that's clearly wrong, because there's been some deep, deep blinding going on. OK, so that you could get some feedback loops. So how much deep blinding goes on? Well, that's a bit worrying in a way. Uh, if somebody did a study quite recently, they had 300 uh, study trial drugs studies from I think, 2010. 300 studies they looked through looking to see were considerations of deep blinding taken into account. Only 24 mentioned the possibility that deep blinding had taken place, of which 16 reported uh, that there was compromised blinding going on. So this, you'd think, would underestimate the proportion, wouldn't you? Because some of these drug companies are sure as hell not going to want to tell you that there's deep blinding going on. So of those honest enough to mention it, two-thirds tell you that there's, bl there's deep blinding going on, compromised blinding. Um, OK, <laughs> some of these things are pretty obvious. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a difference in the taste and odor of a, of a, of a, of a bit of the treatment. I mean, it's going to be blazingly obvious to the people <laughs> on the the positive wing of the trial that they're on, the positive wing of the trial. They're even giving out advice that in the very recent years um, that when, when people are put on the trials, they're randomized and then they're given, they're assigned numbers which uh, accord to the, tr the treatments that they're going to receive. Um, now, a lot of these people are doing it so the numbers for the placebo wing are all in a row, like, you know, 1 to 200, and the, num the ones on the, the, the real wing are sort of 201 to 400. Making you think, you know, so the person on the, on the, on the, on who's dishing them out, who sees 368, and you, you get 369, they're probably going to realise they're on the same wing. <laughs> so you're, you're surprising enough you, that they need to be told that you ought to be randomising the numbers as well as. <laughs> but how, I mean, how much deep blinding is going on? Okay, so, I mean, sometimes they claim, well, wait a minute, does it matter really whether at the end of the day people have got correct hunches about which wing they're on? Because, well, so if it resulted from the real effectiveness of the drug, it wouldn't matter. So, so there you were, you know, because the proper drug was the one that helped you uh, to improve in some way, therefore you know you're on the real wing uh, of the trial. Uh, but that's after the event, so it doesn't matter. But that's, again, a bit strange. These trials take place over quite a long period of time. Uh, is it not possible that fairly early improvements get picked up and then they get exacerbated by the placebo effect? Okay. I mean, there are studies out there suggesting that, uh, particularly around, um, uh, this is from a book I'll mention in a minute, um, particularly around antidepressants, that the whole effect is coming from, from successful guessing. Worrying if so. Um, yeah, so interesting studies out there. They're, they're sort of trying to, well, it really isn't linear at all. It's a very complicated process. So you enter into these trials, you've got various expectations, you as a person have had a history of being treated in a certain way, you start the treatment, you know, and perhaps the drug does start to begin to do something, you get the first improvements, 
um, that comes back and because of certain expectations you have that starts boosting the expectancy factor on your part um, or also the drug might have side effects nothing to do with the actual illness you have and that of course alerts you to the fact that you're on the real drug so you then uh, get positive expectations of what's going to happen okay and now you've maybe somewhat conditioned even by the taking of the drug to feel better so maybe that's having an effect as well even the going through the drug trial itself you've been conditioned from the beginning of this phase and it's having an effect um, on the on the overall outcome okay um i mean a lot yeah this is always a slight danger as well that because the world of rct has sort of reduced the scope of what we're looking at about effects of the mind and body to placebo effects that you you can end up thinking it's limited to, to not particularly well to pain perception perhaps however important that is um, perhaps to dep as well as a depression. I mean, they are finding this this thing, you know, and, and it shouldn't be so surprising given those stuff, the stuff I told you earlier about uh, the way that uh, you know, stress levels affect all sorts of components in your body, make you more prone to cancer and so on. Um, right, they're finding it does affect all sorts of areas of your life in your body, um, right through heart, lungs, immune system, and so on. So, so we get this rather well. Yes, great. Phenomena of learned placebo responses in neuroendocrine and immune functions is a fascinating example of the communication between the brain, the endocrine, and the peripheral immune systems. Yeah, yes. So let's study it in more detail. But not, not just through an RCT. Uh, I've got a case here, perhaps, it's um, just to show that the heart. See, they're getting surprised here. This is one to st uh, a study on people who have a, a, a pain in the chest, probably some kind of angina perhaps of some kind um, we're randomizing this group and we're going to give one half of, one half of the group a verbal suggestion that they're going to be given a drug and it will help them with the flow of their blood and then we've got a control group who aren't told anything they're all going to be given this, this saline solution through a catheter um, so then everyone's blinded to this we go through the process uh, we're monitoring all sorts of things and what they're finding is the, the group that were given the verbal suggestion, the coronary diameter, was significantly affected by verbal suggestions. So that's kind of interesting result. Now you might have thought, and they were thinking, strange things they suggested, it wasn't just through their expectation they were passing on about how, how this mechanism would work, because they were imagining it was going to dilate these vessels where the blood's throwing through the heart. But it turns out to be the opposite. It tends, to, it tends out to be constriction. The body was cleverer in a way, and it knew to constrict these vessels to increase the blood flow through the, through the heart. Clever old heart. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay, they, they're suggesting a whole range of mechanisms that, that might be involved in that. Okay, so, so something you notice in this literature is always, they always characterize the mechanisms going on as, as involving conditioning and expectancy. So there's a whole slew of studies on how you condition things like the immune functioning of rats uh, using saccharine drinks or something like that, plus immunosuppressant drugs, and then you just use the condition, uh, the, the conditioning stimulus, and produce the same effect. So they're thinking, I mean, maybe we can apply this to humans. Uh, you know, we've got a human; they've had an organ transplant. Would it, it be nice if we, could, instead of giving these rather vicious immunosuppressant drugs, we could intersperse that with some placebos? Uh, yeah, and generate the same immunosuppression. Now, of course, to be able to do that, I'd better have gone through RCT on specifications, I suppose. So there's a question that to the extent, you know, this is not just uh, finding out some stuff happens, but to the extent you think you're gonna involve it in your, in your actual medical practice, had it better go through RCT analysis to make sure it's legitimate. I suppose there's a question, a question there. Um, but just to end with, uh, and there are, so you're starting to get the rise of an alternative ways of thinking. Here's a guy uh, based in Holland, Alfano. Uh, that there's something horribly limiting about, so this whole rich world of the effects of mind on body is being very, very channeled by this RCT ideology. I mean, something in particular, particular it doesn't seem a good idea is that uh, you're defining this placebo in this negative way, you're defining it as something which is it doesn't you know it's non-characteristic it's non-specific it's got all these negatives attached to it 
Uh, Alfano doesn't think this is the best way to go. He thinks, well, he buys enough into the existing orthodoxy to think expectancy and conditioning are two uh, mechanisms, but he thinks there's a third one as well. Uh, somatic attentional feedback loops, where you paying attention to activity in your body can produce uh, a feedback loop. In fact, there's a lot of this stuff on biofeedback, and that's talking around in the news, that you can do things, you can change the temperature in your finger by so many degrees by sort of uh, concentrating, having a feedback mechanism that tells you the temperature in, in your finger, say, and uh, feeding back somehow your body sort of knows how to, how to do these things. There are more radical things out there which has us going away from, from the humans as, as a sort of just a, a sort of simple stimulus response kind of machine to going full continental, if you like, Going, going down the uh, phenomenological route, if you're Frankel, inactive, Heideggerian sort of stuff that's coming out. Interesting ways now of thinking about things. But let me uh, just end with uh, a, few, a few thoughts from all this. Yeah, it's, it's dangerous because you, it's so limited to certain kinds of um, typically rather minor effects because they tend to be studying the placebo effect. You tend to be, and, and, and for fairly short duration, you're only really seeing some fairly minor effects. But don't forget, I mean, you know, there's things you're not going to find through this methodology, which is long-term effects of state of mind on health. You know, don't be in long-term abusive relationships. You know, your gut will leak, all sorts of bad things will happen. It's not good. Um, so that the nocebo, which is probably more, effect, more powerful in some ways than the placebo effect, gets, a, gets neglected because we can't really do that, unfortunately. We can't affect humans and do unpleasant things to them. Uh, do the rare. Huh? The rare. <laughs> Be sceptical. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty shocking, actually. I think some of those particularly depression-type studies, I think the deep blinding that's going on through that, I think you should be very worried about some of the, some of the evidence coming through there. So is it, is it blinkering? I, think, I, don't think, I rather think it is. It's, 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 it's turning attention to a sort of very limited part of the world of, of health by thinking it's all about the measuring the efficacy of interventions, particular kinds of interventions, particularly drug interventions. So that, uh, and once you, once you throw those blinkers away, you start to see a lot more out there in the world, things that can't really be studied through the RCT approach, the idiopathic approach, which gives you, you know, if you want to go for an ambitious sort of program, make, make you want to rethink uh, how the body and mind work in tandem together. Uh, I don't know, do we have to go continental? Well, who knows? <laughs> Good. Okay, well, I'll end there. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, the one on one? Oh, well, I saw first. Yes, I just want to defend RCT methodology. Good. <laughs> Good. 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 So, you asked a question about whether this uh, sort of technique of interspersing. Um, as treatment with a mm. placebo mm. would be well tested by carrying out a randomised control trial. And it seems to me that it would, an RCT sort of seems an ideal way mm. to carry out that test because of the very fact that you pointed out that there are these sort of complicated mechanisms behind the placebo and mm. feedback loops and things. And what the RCT is going to give us is mm. evidence of an overall, like we don't understand what's going on in the black box, but at least it's shown that there's this particular difference. So is, is that one way of... Um, mm -hmm. Okay, it's good. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Of RCTs? yeah I, didn't, I didn't mean... Did I come across as being very, very <laughs> harsh? <laughs> no, I, I would have really no objection to that kind of study at all. That's, that's, that's a good study. <laughs> where, well, now, whether to the extent you need to roll out these, these practices, these, these therapeutic practices, you have to have it to run through there. I mean, that seems a nice case because it would run through very nicely. I've got these broader concerns that it's kind of constricting our vision, though, all the same. But, I th yeah, I don't object to talk about that being a good case of applying. Where you can apply it, it's good, it's fine, it's not, it's not a problem. You've just got to be pretty careful. Yeah. And, and I think people are really underestimating the deep blinding thing. Uh, yeah. Um, I was wondering about, so you said about this sort of like, interactive effect um, mm -hmm. between placebo. I, I, I'm I, I really don't. So I have seen you talk about this quite a bit, like using the word placebo. Good, yeah. Give it up. The body's own pathways. Like it. And there's the evidence of, you've presented evidence of 
you need some sort of priming of the body pathways for the intervention to take effect. And that seems quite plausible anyway, biologically. But I was thinking about when, so one of the central claims of the medical nihilism, nihilism thesis is that we've got these small 